Solid rock and roll. That's the way that we like to do it here in the Ones Ready team room. Welcome back, everybody. We got a big one for you this week. 37 years in the Army, achieved the highest of the highs as a command sergeant major, but that wasn't enough. He decided <laughs> that he wanted to be the third senior enlisted advisor to the Joint Chiefs. That's a big deal. We had previous, uh, you know, number four, CAC number four, PJ, instructor of mine, uh, Uncle Ray Ray Ramon Colon Lopez, uh, himself, CZ on the podcast. We had Tim uh, Pachesa on and, and Chachi said, hey, you've got to get John Wayne Troxel on. So uh, I, I'm not one to say no, especially to somebody that outranks me and has had a better career. So <laughs> CAC number three, John Wayne Troxel, welcome. Thanks for coming on, sir. We appreciate you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Peaches. It's an honor to be here today. Yeah, the honor is a hundred percent on this side of the camera and not yours. Let's be let's be real let's, about yeah, that real let's, fast. Let's be real. Like thirty-seven years is a ton of time. Usually we ask guests, hey, you know, give me a, a little bit of, of a of a wag of your career. I'm gonna start it off with you. There's not a whole lot of guys out there wearing, you know, that mustard stamp on those wings for having a combat jump, but you're one of the few uh that has done so in, in just cause. So just to date us a little bit, Peaches is not the oldest person on the podcast. I am. When I was two, you decided to get in to the United States Army and pursue a career that ended up leading you, you know, to your de you know, December 2019 retirement as the as just the third SEAC, which is the highest ranking enlisted position in the entire military. So all the way from those those precocious young days coming out of Iowa in the early 1980s to where you are now. Just tell us, tell our listeners kind of like some of those highlights and things that you valued along the way. And I know that is a ton. So I'll shut up and get out of your way. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when I grew up, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in a loving household and everything. I mean, it was a broken home. My father, um, you know, and my mother got divorced. My father ended up going to prison and everything. But my stepfather came in. He was kind of that father figure, you know. And uh, so I grew up in a loving home, but I, I never really grew up with purpose, motivation or direction. You know, I was, you know, you know, a half assed athlete, you know. I love carousing with my friends and drinking beer and chasing girls and all that, but I never really had goals that I was setting. And so when I was getting ready to graduate high school, you know, I saw people coming back from the military in my neighborhood and everything and saw the change that had, that had come about them from military service. So I joined the military and never thinking that, you know, this was going to be my career or whatever. So the minute I got to my first duty station, you know, the worst thing that can happen to a young Joe, besides buying a brand new car, you know, which I did and everything, is I met a woman in oh, uh, no. yeah, Bella that's Bella. it. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I've been married to 40 years, for 40 years for to her now. Sandra is my wife. And so I met her and, you know, and everything. And I didn't really have direction until all of a sudden, you know, we had been dating for about six months and pretty soon we were expecting our first child. And then we got married shortly after that. Now I had family responsibilities. And I knew then that it wasn't just about me. And I needed to be the best soldier that I could be to take care of my family. <clears throat> and because I was going to do this thing in the Army, I wanted to, you know, have, make it an adventure. So the first thing I did was, you know, volunteer to go to airborne school and, you know, got my airborne wings. Uh, I went did a tour in Germany in a heavy division you know, after I'd gone to airborne school and, uh, you know, my desire there was to join the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg. And so I reenlisted for that and got there in 1987. And all of a sudden I realized I was part of an organization that all they talked about was going to war. Now, we were a peacetime military in the 80s. You know, I mean, uh, Urgent Fury happened in 83 in Grenada. And, you know, there were some things throughout the mid 80s that happened you know, that went below the threshold of conflict, you know, um, with, you know, folks from Libya and everything, you know, the discotheque bombing in Berlin, you know, TWA Flight 847 hijacked and Navy diver Robert Dean Stephen was, you know, murdered and everything. But there was never really, you know, a conflict. And uh, I got to the 82nd, all they talked about was going to war. And, you know, you got to be ready to fight and win. You got to, and all of a sudden I realized I was in, a tank full of piranha and that if I don't become a piranha myself and, and, you know, if I try to be a goldfish that I'm going to get eaten up and I'm not going to last here. So I immediately adopted the culture. You know, it took me a little bit, you know, because I had come from the heavy world where 
we weren't focused focused on being highly physically fit or highly trained and everything. It was about, you know, meeting minimum standards and everything. And all of a sudden I was part of an organization that transformed me um, to being this guy that lived the warrior ethos. And, you know, and it got to the point where I was, you know, hoping that we would go to war because we were doing all this training. We were doing all these things to get ready. And I was like, who, who wants a shot at the title here? You know, right. In 1988, I was in jump master school. And when, uh, you know, the, the events in Honduras, you know, rose up, you know, where the Sandinista guerrillas, you know, had come across, uh, from El Salvador into Honduras and operation golden pheasant took on, it wasn't a combat operation, but it was a no notice deployment. Unfortunately, I didn't do it. My company did, but I was in jump master school and they weren't going to allow me to stop. And I thought, okay, I hope that wasn't my opportunity that I missed combat. And then December, 1989 rolled around and, you know, here still a peacetime military and I'm on division ready force one, a one hour recall, which meant I couldn't go on half day schedule leave. You know, I couldn't go on Christmas leave, but I was on half day schedule. And on that first day of the 19th of December, you know, there had been some things going on. One of our platoons had moved covertly into Central America. We didn't know exactly where um, we're pre-positioned to support, you know, what later became operations against uh, Noriega and everything. And, uh, you know, there had been a lieutenant that had been killed, a Marine lieutenant that was had been killed in Panama. There had been families assaulted by the Panamanian Defense Forces and Noriega's Dignity Battalions. And then the straw that broke the camel's back was Noriega lost the election and refused to step down. And so, but even then, we we still didn't think that we would end up in combat. And I left work the morning of the 19th of December, 1989, kissed my wife goodbye and my kids and got to work and we were alerted. And I, we, we marshaled, we moved to the personnel holding area. It was a freezing rainstorm and everything. And still we didn't think we thought this was just an exercise that, you know, to try and cause Noriega to stand down and everything. But then all of a sudden we went and we drew live ammunition. You know, we drew claymores, we drew grenades, we drew uh, all the stuff necessary for combat. And yet still nobody was telling us what was going on. And we were in these freezing ass tents over on Pope Air Force Base, you know. And so finally my platoon sergeant, I was a squad leader at the time, my platoon sergeant and I, Dave Freeman decided we're going to find out what the fuck is going on here. And so we went over to the tactical operations center and there's a kid standing outside guarding it, you know, and, and uh, we walk up and he says, can we see, can we see, he says, can I see your credentials? And we said, no, get the fuck out of the way. And we walked in, you know, and when we I love big time, in, some poor E4, I mean, you know what, that guy, that guy has a story for the rest of his life. Cause he's like, you know what, there was this one time the SEAC told me to get the fuck out of his way. And I had to, <laughs> nobody's ever going to believe that guy. He's like out somewhere and they're like, Hey man, tell us about the coolest time in the military. Yeah. All right. Well, some guys were getting ready to go do something. I wish I could have done. And I I got lippy with a dude. And it turns out that guy was SEAC number three. Gave me a rap on the beak. Gave me a rap on the Beezer. That's what happens when people talk at all reckless. <laughs> Yeah, but we went in there and there were staff officers laminating maps of Panama. And we knew then, and then I was hearing the S3 Air talk about the jump. You know, he was doing his kind of pre-brief. And I heard him say, drop altitude will be 500 feet, AGL. Well, at and least I, you don't need a reserve. Then, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I looked at my, I looked at Dave Freeman. I said, well, I guess what we're knowing, we're doing now and there's no need for us to have a reserve parachute either. You know, <laughs> yeah. That yep. bad boy ain't going to open if the main doesn't open. <laughs> nah, so anyways, we, got one we, shot. Back. We, we let everybody know pretty soon the orders. We went through the orders process. Next thing you know, we were on 20 C-141 airplanes heading to Panama. Free, we were freezing our asses off. We got on those planes, combat concentrated load. I had a mortar base plate digging in one leg. I had a Dragon missile jump pack digging in my leg in the other. I think my whole kit together with my rock ammunition and everything, I was well over 120 pounds. And dude, it was, it was so uncomfortable down there freezing. Our, we, because the minute they closed the doors, all of that cold was still in there. So we're freezing our ass off. We are uncomfortable as hell. 
and it's going to be about a two and a half, three hour flight. And I'm like, man, I just want to get the fuck out of this door. I don't care mm. how much anti-aircraft fire is going on. That's I'm going to get the hell out of here. So pretty soon, you know, I mean, the doors came open and everything and that blast furnace of Panamanian heat came in, which we were like, yes, because it warmed us up. But then we noticed and, you know, that, uh, you know, there was a fire going on in Torrijos Airport and the Rangers had already jumped in into Tocumen Airfield, the military airfield, uh, just adjacent to it. And we knew that uh, the enemy knew we were coming. Um, now, thankfully, we had Spectre gunships that just hosed down all of the suspected enemy areas when we came in, which allowed us to exit the plane and get the hit the ground. But uh, we knew then the mission was real. And then as we, you know, as we, uh, you know, formed up and we got to our Gavin 4, you know, 80% of our strength, and we started expanding the lodgement area um, into Panama City, City, we were fighting block by block. And, you know, it was an hour into the operation when we we had our first killed in action, a uh, young man, Specialist Alejandro Manrique Lozano uh, from 2nd Battalion, 504th Parachute Infantry. Now think of this, 24 hours before, we were all thinking we were going to be on half-day schedule, enjoying it with our families and everything. And here, 24 hours later, a kid is killed in action already. And, and that is when it kind of hit that this thing is real. When you see one of your battle buddies, you've never been to combat, you've seen one of your battle buddies, you're a peacetime military, and you see a guy with glint tape on, an 82nd Airborne Division patch, and he's dead of gunshot wounds. That kind of brings it all into perspective. And we knew then, one, that the mission was real, but two, that these assholes weren't going to lay down, and we needed to, to take the wood to their ass. And so over the course of the next five days, up until about Christmas Day, we were just hammering the PDF, and pretty soon they were surrendering left and right. The Dignity Battalions, Noriega's kind of mafia-type guys, they fought a little harder, um, but we sent plenty of those guys uh, to their maker, too. But about Christmas Day, things started calming down, and, uh, you know, I found myself <clears throat> pulling security at the Papal Nuncia where Noriega was holed up at, you know, the religious kind of— uh, cathedral where he hid at, you know, to try to get religious asylum so that we wouldn't extradite his ass for all his crimes and everything. And so, you know, our our PSYOPs guys came down there and had put these large speakers up and everything. And we were blaring, you know, Metallica into that. I was going to say, what was the song choice? Like at <laughs> yeah. that time, it had to be Guns N' Roses, baby. Like you're listening to nothing <laughs> I mean, but was, Welcome yeah, to the Jungle. Absolutely. You know, Fantastic. Uh, the jungle was one of them. Yeah. And, and then there was other stuff, you know, like Martha and the Val Vandellas, nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Get a little soul in there. Now we're yeah. talking like that was the original, you know, we had to figure that out later in GWAT where you had to make a special cord that you could plug into your iPod so that you could listen to stuff going on target. Usually Taylor Swift. Oh, yeah. big Taylor, big Taylor Swift pre mission guy. Damn, There's dude, nothing you, more you satisfying about beer for, I, you know, I don't know if I, if I'd let the general public know that brother. Oh, <laughs> Listen, listen here, Siak. Listen, if you think that's the worst thing the general public knows about me, woo, you better get out of here. Pre-mission songs are always good. Um, yeah, but how, how did you feel when that was sort of winding up? The surreal aspect of you being, you know, we talk about it often with just the speed of warfare today. You know, you can be in Germany one second and Iraq and another and home all within the same 72-hour period. And, yeah, you know, for you, things went from woe to wow, or as the kids would say, from zero to a hundred real effing quick as you were on a Christmas schedule. And then suddenly you were thrust into something that you'd never dealt with. And for people out there that aren't putting two and two together, this is before Gothic Serpent. This is before Somalia. This is before the American public really had any, it's before Gulf War One. Yeah. This is before any shock and awe or American firepower and might this, we really were a peacetime military that had not seen many kinetic actions since the close of really the Vietnam War in the early 70s. And you on the ground as a young man are now dealing with those realities. Is that operation, as, as we got Noriega and you started to, to come back home, did you feel like this was going to happen all the time? Did you feel that was like a diamond in the rough sort of scenario? And for lack of a better word, you got lucky to be on target? How, how did you feel coming out of well, Just I Cause? Felt, one, I felt grateful um, that I belong to a, a rapid deployment organization 
that was at the tip of the spear for something like this. It's something that I always wanted, you know, after I had said, hey, the military is going to be what I want to do. And then in terms of what the mission of the 82nd Airborne Division was at that time, it's exactly how I envisioned it. An airfield seizure, land, hit assault objectives on the airfield, expand the lodgement, you know, build uh, uh, capacity for follow-on forces to come in and ultimately, you know, defeat the threat and, you know, safeguard the population and then turn it into mm -hmm. the operations where civil affairs folks and folks <laughs> like that can, uh, you know, take over the fight and stuff. So, you know, going from, you know, saying goodbye to my wife and thinking that, you know, hey, I'm going to come home. It's bowl season. I'm going to watch a lot of football games and everything. And then two days later, being in a three-point ambush, you know, uh, in in downtown Panama City, you know, with 50 cal being fired at me. And if and if you go to the, the 82nd Museum, you know, on Camp, on Fort Liberty right now, there's a Sheridan tank up there. And that was the one that I, that was my tank that I rode on. And still on the front of that, there are 50 cal chippings where we were taking 50 cal fire from these uh, Panamanian defense forces and everything. But when it was winding down, it allowed me to reflect. And finally on Christmas day, I, you know, I hadn't talked to my wife when I, I kissed her goodbye there, you know, they, they cut the phone lines. There's no cellular network or email back then. So I said, Hey, she's going to figure out sooner or later I'm in combat. And hopefully it's not by, you know, receiving a call from a casualty notification team, you know? And, uh, so I, I snuck over to the Marriott hotel when we were, uh, you know, garden, you know, Noriega at the papal nuncia and went in and made a collect call to her. And, and it was a very emotional call, but it also brought me back to, okay, now I can think about my family. Now I can think about, you know, potentially spending time with my children again, because the minute this thing kicked off, I had to flush all of that out of my brain and had to focus on the mission. Are my guys as ready as I, they could be? Are we prepared for what's up? Do we know the threat as well as we could? Um, what are our, you know, our battle drills? Are we prepared to do that? Do I have all my stuff positioned where I could rapidly do magazine changes and anything I needed to do? All of that stuff all of a sudden took over instinctively because of our training. And so I didn't have time to think about, you know, mom and pop America, my family, you know, you know, you know, college bowl games or nothing like that. And so it was like after I talked to my wife, I had this adrenaline dump a little bit because, you know, we hadn't seen we hadn't had any enemy contact in like 48 hours. Um, basically, the PDF had, you know, capitulated and uh, Noriega was about to be, you know, on the run and or, or captured and everything. So it kind of but it gave me time to reflect. And I said, OK, one combat is exactly what I thought it would be. OK, and it is brutal and unforgiving uh, because, you know, we, the 82nd, lost four paratroopers. Uh, and then on the assault on Tina Hittas Hill that I was a part of, two paratroopers were killed there, uh, Daves and Denson. And uh, and then 18 overall were killed in action. So it was my first, um, you know, kind of understanding of what ramp ceremonies were about when Americans coming home killed and everything. But it fueled me to say, okay, this was the first one here. I don't know when war is coming again, but I'm going to make sure that the, the troops that I'm in charge of are going to be best prepared and that we are going to have competitive advantages over any threat. Because physically, mentally, emotionally, and technically, and tactically, I'm going to make sure that they are ready to fight and win, period. And that means that I'm not going to be the most popular guy in the world. But in the end, I'm going to be the guy that makes sure they're ready to go and ready to do the job, whatever our nation asks. And so that's that kind of propelled me. And here we go seven months later, you know, Saddam Hussein invades Iraq or, or excuse me, invades Kuwait. And next thing you know, two weeks later, I'm on a flight and, you know, now I'm part of Desert Shield and ultimately Desert Storm. Now, you know, Desert Storm, you know, with two plus cores of troops. And plus all the work, you know, that the Air Force did uh, with dropping bombs and certainly guys like you, you all that are, you know, you know, the studs when it comes to putting rounds on 
target or warheads on foreheads, as you guys call it. That was the, the, the significant part of that fight. Don't get me wrong. There was significant ground combat too, but the ground combat I saw in Desert Storm had nothing on what I saw in Just Cause and certainly nothing in subsequent fights in Iraq and Afghanistan. But it, and you can kind of feel it. And so after Desert Storm, when I came back, I got assigned to Germany and I said, we're going to wear camouflage paint in the field all the time. We are going to wear our body armor all the time. And now we immediately reverted back to a peacetime military right after that. And all of a sudden people wanted to be 60 percenters again. And a guy like Troxel is saying, fuck, no, we ain't going to be 60 percenters. Right. We're going to be 90 yeah. percenters. And if you don't like it, move the fuck out, dude, because we are going to be the baddest MFers on the planet because I don't know what's going to happen next. But I'm going to be on the winning team because we're going to do shit right. We're going to be ready to go and everything. Again, I wasn't very popular, but the troops that I had under me loved it. And they absolutely wanted to be a part of it. People on my adjacent left and right were like, I don't know what that asshole is smoking, but I ain't going near him. All right. Right. Bottom line is that kind of shaped me for the kind of leader I was for the rest of my career, striving for excellence in everything we did, you know, whether it was combat, whether whatever it is, being a key team player. And I don't give a shit if it was the prayer breakfast that the chaplain was having. He was going to get 110 percent support from me and the troops under me. Well, so whether it was combat or anything and in between and even including the family readiness group, I was going to support it to the nth degree. And my troops and I were going to be the ones that were striving for excellence in everything. Well, I know Peaches can hear it. I can hear it. When we talk to, you know, when we talk to folks that are kind of like inside the circle, right? We're in the trust tree with the, with the nest right now. It's hard to explain to somebody that doesn't understand how a leader develops, but I can hear it. All of these little stepping stones, you know, you get out of your first, you know, even before you came in, you saw something and you could recognize, hey, I don't know what they've got, but they've got it. I want to be a part of that. So I'm going to get in the army. Absolutely. And then when you get to the 82nd Airborne, you're like, listen, I don't know what it is about these All-American boys, but I know that they're <laughs> on a short hook and I know that I'm going to have the opportunity to do it, but it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take me getting my shit together and figuring out how to be the best jump master, how to be the best jumper, how to be the best individual soldier, how to get up in the handbook and understand regulations and the way that we train and do all this other stuff. But then those experiences are validated by the fact that you got, and it's terrible that we lost 18 in just cause, but I'll tell you what, it should have been a hundred. It should have been more than that. But thanks to the professionalism of the men and women that went and performed that operation from logistics all the way to the tactical expo, uh, you know, the, the tactical exposition on the ground. That's because of those leadership lessons that you've learned. And now, of course, when you get to Germany, of course, you're like, no, 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 new sheriff in town, baby. And not everybody's going to get it, but you have those things behind you to where you can start following who you are as a leader and you can start building those building blocks. And it just takes, you know, a simple, you know, turn in that corner and, and making that realization. Did you make that realization there? Like what the question I'm, I'm building to is when did you know that you wanted to be not just a, a leader at the tactical level, not just at the operational level, but when did you realize that you wanted to be a strategic level leader in the army? Well, I think, you know, after just cause and desert storm, I just wanted to more responsibility, you know, and I wanted to be challenged in everything I did, you know, and uh, <clears throat> to the point I went to, I left the 82nd, I went to Germany and I saw, you know, kind of the, some of the lackadaisical attitude people had, you know, over there because the wall had come down, you know, six years earlier and, you know, Russia or the Soviet Union had splintered, Russia was in decline and everything. And, you know, but, you know, what I saw on the horizon was what was going on in Bosnia and things like that. And I was like, well, that could be our next battlefield, you know. And the bottom line is, you know, I had seen what being successful in combat was all about. If you do it, if you train right, if, uh, you know, you do all the basics, the, the blocking and tackling right, how successful you can be. And uh, and I wanted to make sure that we were never shorthanded. But the more I continued to get after, you know, like being a platoon sergeant and everything, I wanted more responsibility. So then I wanted to be a first sergeant. Not so much because I wanted the, you know, the the title and everything. I wanted more response. I wanted to influence more people. And so I was striving, you know, 
to make my team the best it could be. Now, I live by this attitude, though. I'm going to continue to do the job I'm doing now until somebody to tells, me to, tells me to do it differently. But any leader that's worth his salt wants to have more responsibility. They want to have a greater impact on the force or, or men and women around them and everything. So that's kind of the way I was. And so I just continued to strive for excellence be the best that I could be in everything I did and made my troops the best that they could be and good things happened. And all of a sudden the promotions started coming and everything. And the more, you know, I had a company now, I wanted to be a battalion CSM. And then, you know, I just continued to want to serve because I absolutely loved it. Uh, I knew I was making an impact and uh, you know, and I just, it was like a drug to me. I wanted to continue to grow, develop, and continue to have more responsibility. Now, did I ever think that I would become the CF? Absolutely not. It didn't even exist. It wasn't, thing, it couldn't know. even be a goal for you when you first got in there. Like it wasn't yeah. even a thing that was a thing. You were number three. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, a guy like me, I never had a filter, you know, as a leader, you know, and I, I told people what was on my mind and I wasn't going to be politically correct or succumb to any kind of political kind of, focus, you know, and, you know, so I, I would say my opinion a lot, but what I found out is the good leaders out there, the good commanders, they want a senior enlisted leader. Like yes. That. They want somebody that will have no filter and ain't afraid to tell them, you know, that, you know, their focus or their strategy might be fucked up, you know, and I think that's why I continue to get selected because every time I got selected for a job, I would say, hey, look, I'm going to tell you exactly what's on my mind. I would tell the force it's okay to go out and drink beer. As a matter of fact, meet me at the club on Friday night. The first round's on me, and we're going to build relationships off duty and things like that. Think of now in, in the military today, if a leader got up and said, hey, meet me at the club on Friday night for a beer, shit, he'd be fired by the time he got to the club. He'd already club, be canceled. You, know? you just got somebody canceled yeah, right now, baby. Out already, <laughs> you know, but that's the way I was, you know, yeah. even to the point when I got interviewed by Dunford for the SEAC position, uh, I told him, I said, hey, chairman, if you can, you know, my wife and I still like drinking beer. We like dancing. We like karaoke. We like all this stuff. We enjoy our off-duty time in a responsible manner and everything. So if you can handle that, I'm your guy. And he goes, well, if I do select you, just invite me over because I like doing that shit too. He says. Hell yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think that's why, you know, one, I, I was, I truly love to serve and I wanted to continue to serve. I wanted to continue to reach my untapped potential. I wanted to assist soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen in reaching their untapped potential. And I wanted to make an impact on the force, but more importantly, our nation. And that's why I continue to serve and why I wanted more responsibility at every level. Well, see, with, with that deviation from, and, and it's not even really a deviation, so I'm missing the word actually, but that kind of going against the grain in terms of, you know, telling a commander, Hey, I, I disagree with this, or this is fucked up or, 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 or like, I would not do that. I'm telling you, I would not do that. Um, why do you think that that comes so easy to you or, or even uh, I'll just throw Aaron and I in the, in the same, same mix. Cause I, I know Aaron for sure, even, even more so than me is, is all about telling somebody that they're, they're messed up a commander, but like, why, why do people shy away from that? So this is Troxel's opinion. Okay. This isn't doctrine or anything, but I think the more proximity you have, to the hard shit that you have to do in the military, the, and the more it can have a human cost, the more you're not afraid to say, we may be assuming some unnecessary risks here, or there may be some screwed up shit here that could affect mission accomplishment. Now, again, that's not a hit on anybody or that may be in a combat support or combat service support role, but the closer you are to the heart of battle, you see the human cost and you, you go out of your way and you guys know this, you go out of your way to mitigate as much as possible yeah. the risks that could cause you to lose one of your teammates or to cause your mission to fail. And that causes you to have a sense of urgency that causes you to, you know, um, 
be risk savvy not risk averse and not risk reckless but risk savvy and you are going to weigh risks in a much faster uh, fashion than normal people would and you're going to go through this risk analysis really fast because you know you have to make sound and timely decisions in order to one accomplish the mission two defeat the enemy or three preserve the force and i think that's why people you know, ask me all the time, why are you so aggressive at getting after things? I said, because I spent over 37 years on a time standard to get shit done. Task, purpose, go get it done. Right. Task, okay. purpose, intent. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Intent and end state. Give, give me what I need. Yeah. Like, let's go, man. Absolutely. Like, it's not that hard. Yeah. And, and we live in a society today that, you know, the more aggressive you are, the more you don't waste time in doing risk analysis. And the more you make sound and timely decisions, all of a sudden it's it's kind of toxic, you know. And if right. and if you're, you know, a strong male figure, now it's toxic masculinity if you're doing those kinds of things because you're not moving at a pace that the average person wants to move at because they fear the the repercussions if they make a wrong decision. You know, right. we lived in a, we lived all three of us here. We lived in you know, go and, and make a decision and get after it, you know, and, and don't ask permission, ask for, you know, Hey, forgiveness. You know, <laughs> yeah. Right? Hey, I made hey, the look, best call I could hey, at the time. And this is the call I made. So if we got to talk about it later, I guess we got to talk about it later, but at least we're alive talking about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> I remember, you know, in, during the surge in Iraq and one of the, you know, one of the units I had out there got into a serious firefight. And it got to the point where, you know, they were running low on ammunition. And, and one of the guys out there, one of my guys picked up an AK-47 from an enemy soldier and started shooting at the enemy with it. And Damn right. after the fight was over with, all of a sudden they wanted to investigate this guy for using an enemy weapon to kill the enemy. And I thought to myself, you can't make this shit up. He's about to get hemmed and, up and for shooting a non-NATO round out of an enemy <laughs> rifle. And, yeah. and suddenly it's a war crime. You know, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Here is someone that is eons away from the friction of combat. Yep. And they are trying to pass judgment on a kid that in a split second had to make a decision. Am I going to live or die? Is my team going to live or die? I'm running short on ammunition. I need to, you know, neutralize this threat. So I'm making this decision to do this. It gets back to, you know, you guys, you know, you make. You take prudent risks on where you're going to drop bombs at, and you you go through the the whole targeting cycle, you know, in the kill chain to get after it. And in the end, when you drop the bomb, it kills 50 enemy fighters, but some civilian got wounded. And now we want to investigate you for yep. you know you know not going through the. It just it kills me. And so, you know, the point you know is what I was making earlier. The more you are there at the point of friction for combat and how lethal and brutal and unforgiving it is, the more you're going to be aggressive at making decisions, the more those decisions are going to be sound and timely. And your analysis inside your head is going to be 10 times faster than the average person who isn't accustomed to that, who will think, I've got to move slow here and everything. Well, the yeah. slower you move, the more you can relinquish the initiative to the enemy. And in the end, you could put yourself, your team, and the mission at risk. Yeah, being yeah, no, one hundred percent. And I think that 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 that's where that whole risk aversion comes from, and it comes from you know a lot of a lot of GWAT mentality, you know, the, the a wartime mentality versus a peacetime mentality. Yeah. And I think that that's you know I think we're going to start seeing more of that as as our generation starts to to you know, separate, retire, and then the new generation. Now, the one thing is like, I, I'm not worried about the new generation coming in. Aaron, Aaron and I, and, and Trent, uh, the other host, he, we've all talked about this. We are not worried about the next generation. Cause we actually talk to them because yeah, cause we, don't, we don't sit in an echo chamber yeah. and talk about these dumb kids. Like we actually engage with them hundreds of times a week all yeah. the time for the last yeah. five years. So we're pretty good. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm not worried about them, but what I am worried about is, is the, the leaders that we are developing now is 
because we have been very hands-on, you know, you, you remember a time where, you know, folks, you, you couldn't leave the, the wire without having at least two ISR platforms or, or, you know, yeah. it, it, and there's constant people with their fingers in the pie and in the, in the decision-making matrix that are just second guessing and quarter armchair quarterbacking you and, and the folks that are, you know, your, your mid tier NCOs and now, you know, newly senior NCOs are, are used to that now, or that's what they know. And they don't, I mean, I'm not saying they like it, yeah. but it's one of those things where people tend to, well, that's what I know. And that's the way it was treated. That's the way I was treated. Or that's the way we did things. So I think that's right. So now I'm going to do it to you. We've got to break that. Yeah. I, I'm with you. You know, I, people ask me all the time about this generation and I know this about human beings and especially Americans. They adapt to whatever we ex expect them to do. Now, Gen Zers, yeah, they are used to globalization. You know, maybe their feelings are a little bit more fragile than earlier generations and everything. But they will adapt to military service and they will adapt to what they have to do. But it has to come with dynamic leadership that is by example, you know, and leaders through their presence, their performance, you know, leaders showing them what right looks like and how to, uh, how to accomplish missions. And then the persistence at building them into the machine that is necessary to fight and win, you know, but, you know, we, we went after this thing in the army, especially called people first. And strategically, this goes back to what we were talking about uh, in the green room, you know, um, strategically something could make sense up there. Hey, people first. We want to take care of our folks better. We want to give them better quality of life and all this other stuff. And, you know, but then as it goes from the strategic to the operational, the tactical, somehow it can get skewed like a lot of things do. And pretty soon people first can turn into me first. And all of a sudden, if you have a mm -hmm. of non-commissioned officers and junior officers that are living by that me first thing, then that, that's a problem. And then all of a sudden, yeah. Because that me first thing can create a sense of entitlement. And if that entitlement is not met, they're looking to blame someone because now they're practicing victimism. And usually who do they want to blame? They want to blame the young troops who are a different generation. I'll give you a great example. I was at a army base back in November and I had a meeting, you know, kind of a round table discussion with a bunch of NCOs. And these were all E8s and E9s. So they had basically mastered, you know, their job, uh, you know, top 10% make E8 in the military, top 1% make E9. So they had made it in, in terms of what their professional development model thought they should be over a 20 year career. And they were complaining to me about the promotion system. And I said, you know, I'm sorry. I thought I was talking to a bunch of E8s and E9s. I didn't know it was a bunch of tech sergeants in here that have been 22 <laughs> years that I'm talking to, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, trying to explain to them they may, made it. So two hours later, I was meeting with a bunch of trainees that were uh, in training to be intel specialists. What were they talking to me about? What are we going to do to continue to get after the pacing challenge of China? How do you think the Ukraine war is going to end? Will Russia try to use a tactical nuclear weapon? Israel is all of a sudden going into Hamas. What is that going to do to affect things in the Middle East? These young men and women wanted to know about mm -hmm. the operational environment they were about to go operate in. Meanwhile, these senior NCOs are pissing and moaning about shit that they've already been successful to. <laughs> and I thought to myself, this is the number one problem that when you don't have clear, concise guidance at the strategic level and keep it that way, that all of a sudden it can change. And so now when you look at the armies focus now that General George and Sir Major of the Army Mike Weimer have, it's getting back to discipline. It's getting back to combat because we took our eye off of it with this people first thing. And then the other initiatives that got after, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, and then, you know, the fallout from January 6th, you know, there wasn't a fallout from the unrest of 20 you know, from far left violence. So we had a fallout from far right violence that said that we had an extremism problem in our ranks. And I could talk all day about this, but the bottom line is we were going down a road. And as we were talking earlier, 
that we thought at the strategic level we had everything mapped out right and everything was going to be right. At the tactical level, it was creating chaos. And you guys were probably recipients of that down there where it was confusing as hell. And then all of a sudden, the COVID yeah. vaccination, you take that into account, and all of a sudden, we were exiting people left and right for that and everything. But the bottom line and all of that, it created this sense of entitlement that, you know, wasn't just in young troops. It was in mid-range and, and senior non-commissioned officers and officers where they thought, you know, and then it was okay to go on social media and do dumb shit. Go on to Twitter, yep. now X, you know, some colonel with a freaking dog mask on in his class A uniform. Oh, man. You it's know, a wild time. Or other dumbasses <laughs> yeah. going on there and freaking bad-mouthing the military when they're in uniform. Right. In the, you know, it just created all kinds of shit that now, guess where we're at now? We have this recruiting crisis. The Army hasn't met its numbers the last two years. The Air Force and Navy didn't meet it this year. The Marine Corps made it. They'll grandstand. Yeah, we made it, but they broke the tape on 30 September, all right, to meet their numbers and everything. The Coast Guard didn't make their numbers. The bottom line is now it's not sexy to join the military, okay, because of all of these things that I've been talking about. And on the backside, we have leakage where people are leaving for Peach is what you were talking about because it, it isn't what it was back when I was expected to be this cold, professional, stoic combat warrior that stood in the face of the enemy, sucked it all up, got the job done. And when I got home, all I wanted to do was to be able to get some time off, spend it with my family and drink some beer. I don't need you to grandstand for me or anything like that. Just leave me the fuck alone until you need me to go back and do the job again, you know? So yep. hopefully our military is going to go in the right direction now. I think General C.Q. Brown is the chairman. And uh, Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, are the two leaders that can get us going in the right direction. But we got to leave all this namby pamby shit behind, and we got to focus on what the military exists for—to fight and win our nation's wars. And if we certainly don't have the ability to fight and win, we ain't going to deter anybody. Okay. And so when we talk about integrated deterrence, it has to come down to that men and women are prepared to fight and win, and they understand the oath that they swore means they may have to give their life on it. I can tell you this, Alejandro Manrique Lozano on 19 December 1989 did not all of a sudden say, well, shit, I didn't sign up for this. He went out, he drew all his shit just like I did and in the, the 4,000 other people that made that jump and everything. And he went into combat face first to kill the enemy. And unfortunately, the enemy gets a vote, you know, and he, he gave his life in defense mm -hmm. for his country. But the bottom line is, that's the kind of attitude and focus we need, especially out of our non-commissioned officers and senior non-commissioned officers as we move forward. And stop being, you know, pissing and moaning about shit that doesn't matter when it comes to the last 100 meters of combat. Yep. Yeah, but that doesn't get any clicks no, exactly. or likes. It, Come it, on, Siak. You, you got to know yeah, better than it, that. It doesn't. Complaining yeah. and making memes <laughs> is how you keep the boys frosty. Everybody knows that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, well, so, you know, we were talking about things the way. So I was just at Fort Liberty, the old Fort Bragg, right before Christmas. And I went and did PT with a unit there and got done with PT. And I came out and it's like 10 minutes after seven. And there's nobody running on our den street. And I'm like, man, this place used to be packed, thousands of people every day. And I was asking leaders and they're like, well, you know, we don't do a lot of running. You know, we're getting after more functional fitness. I said, okay, I understand. I said, but when the formations are out there, is it still, you know, hey, you know, talk shit. And pretty soon you come across that yellow line in the middle of our den street. All of a sudden we're throwing fists. Oh, no, we can't do that. <laughs> complain and everything. And I thought the friendly banter that used to go on in, in the the men of war that would meet in something like that, that was all about, you know, you know, an appendage measuring contest, but it was healthy. Some people say, well, it's unhealthy, but in my opinion, it was healthy because we were taking pride in who we were and we were not going to be a second class organization to an organization on the other side of the road and everything. If we don't have that now, where do we get the pride to want to serve and be the best that we can be, you know, so. Well, I mean, I can't I can't say that it exists in, in other 
pieces of the Air Force, but I can I can tell you right now between each of the special tactics units and then with within each of the special tactics units with between each of the flights, they all are very, very okay. competitive. Oh fuck those Bravo guys. Flights, those guys, those are guys don't even train. Shoes, Bravo you know? flight doesn't do anything. That's just inside the unit. And then inside of Bravo yeah. flight, two 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 and two 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 three, somebody didn't restock the fridge and they we gotta go to fisticuffs over that, my guy. Hey dude, when, whenever I need, you know, a feel good moment of mine when I'm out visiting the troops. I go visit the special tactics squadrons or the ace offices <laughs> because those guys still are the same kind of yep. <laughs> that they've been before. And they will talk shit to each other and they, they have no filter and everything. And, you know, one of the best moments I've had in retirement is speaking at the lightning challenge in 2021, you know, and being around all of those, you know, battlefield airmen and everything. And then at the, you know, the, the, a banquet at the end and listening to the friendly banter back and forth, you know, and, and then it was just, there's not enough of that in our military now. And some people look on it as this toxicity now and everything. And I, I just disagree with it wholeheartedly. Yeah. And, and so what I, what I want to ask you then is because, and you've brought it up, you, you said the, the coined phrase, you know, good order and discipline. And I think to, and we had the same conversation with Chachi, and, and I loved it because people seem to think that discipline now, or or at least may, maybe I'm generalizing too much, but discipline is obedience, yeah. and, and it's not. Yeah. Discipline is not obedience. And so, it, I, what I'm, my question to you is: What, do, in your words, what do you consider good order and discipline? And are we at it or do we, or where do we need to go from here to, to reach it? Well, I think in good order and discipline is about self-discipline, meaning we are building buy-in to the force, that to the men and women in our charge. We don't want them just to say, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full. We don't want that obedience. We want them to own it. And how do you get them to own it? It's leadership through example, like I was talking about. And I always talk about those three P's, you know, the leader presence, you know, is the leader there sharing in the hardships that the troops are? Is the leader at the point of friction that they need to be to make a sound and timely decision? Are they leading by their in-person appearance instead of through email or text message, you know? And then their performance, whatever they expect the men and women in their charge to do, then they ought to be doing it with them. Does that mean they got to be the fastest runner or the best shot? No, but whatever they expect their troops to do, they better be doing it with them. And then ultimately persistence in building a strive for excellence mentality and balancing the humanity that comes with being a leader in terms of empathy and compassion with the necessity for discipline and accountability that will get after the efficiency of the organization in its basic combat mission and in their basic combat tasks. And if you put all of that together, you're going to build self-discipline and ownership into the men and women in your force. You know, I see too many leaders that do as I say and not as I do. And they think that they can build a disciplined, cohesive organization that way. Absolutely not. At the first opportunity, they're going to put your ass on roller skates and roll you down the road. Okay. So um, I think it's all about self-discipline. Instead of building discipline, build self-discipline where that person owns it. And that will automatically start instilling, and people hate when I say this, a healthy fear in the organization. A healthy fear isn't, I'm afraid that, you know, somebody's going to take action against me. Healthy fear means I respect my team and my leadership so much that I'm not going to let them down. And also, that healthy fear means that if the leader looked at them and said, I'm disappointed in your performance here, that would have a major impact, much more than if they said, all right, I'm going to give you a counseling statement or, you know, you know, NJP or UCMJ or something like that. That wouldn't have an impact. The impact on them is that they let their leader down. And so that's how I think we have to get after it. But there's not enough leaders that are out there doing that, that are saying, follow me and I will show you how everything is supposed to be done. 
because of this risk aversion we're talking about. That if they all of a sudden have this aggressive and focused kind of attitude and striving for excellence, and the people on the left and right are only 60 percenters, I'm like, well, why does this asshole think he's going to, I'm not trying to outshine you. We're trying to outshine ourselves and be the best that we can be because in the end, I'm going to have the advantage over the enemy in combat. And instead of, you know, hoping that my leadership will save me because I'm not battle ready and everything, you know, I think that's what we got to get after. And that means leaders have to be boisterous. And every, now, you know, if you're boisterous, then, you know, you're, you're not confident as a leader, you're cocky and you're arrogant, you know, but then uh, you go the other way and you try to be humble. Well, they don't want you just to be humble. Now they want you to be self-loathing, you know, and I even heard this E9 one time and I almost wanted to fold this guy up like a chair and beat his ass. Telling an E4 <laughs> on one of my trips, I heard this E9. It was in the dining facility telling the C4, dude, if I could, I would take my rank off and give it to you. And, you know, and give you all the privileges that come with this. No, dude, <laughs> you spent 20, 25 years to get to the E9 position. This kid's been in about five or six years. Tell him if you keep applying yourself and you follow the steps of this development program that I'm setting out for you, maybe you could be in my chair one day. But right now, be what you are. You're an E4. Do the things necessary that you have to be successful to be an E5. But, you know, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself because I'm not an E4 with 25 <laughs> right. years in. Yeah. All right. I'm not going to hate myself for that, you know. And that goes back to the point earlier on how we all of a sudden that young troop now has a sense of entitlement. But he's oh, he's going to be an E9. I'm, I'm here. I come to yeah. work. I'm going to be an E9. No, dude. No, maybe yeah. you won't be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, but there's there's too many leaders that, that think like that. And I think it's counter. And guess what? It's having an effect on those youngsters that are at a, at a critical point. Of, do I stay in or get out? And all of a sudden they get out because they don't have this, this mentor, this leader that they say, one day I could be that person. You know, um, if I applied myself, I worked hard and I went through all the necessary steps to get to where I was at. So on the enlist or where I yeah, need on, to the, be. on the enlisted side, I completely agree with you. I uh, just like you, um, you know, you do it better than me. And obviously you're the subject matter expert on this one and not I. But I always thought that there should be additional courses in PME to help you be that mentor if you have that inside of you, because I think that is something that we miss. And really what it is, is I want to be able to point to somebody and go, OK, I want to be like them. I want the badges they have, the experiences they have, the rank that they have, whatever they may possess as, as a personal sort of power. Okay, cool. But really what I want is when you look at somebody that's accomplished, you can see how much they love the mission. When your mentor tells you, hey, I'm yeah. disappointed in you, he's not saying, per he or she is not saying, I'm personally disappointed in you as a person. They're saying, I love this mission. I'm trying to do my best for the mission. I feel like you're not doing the best for the mission. And I feel like we lost that yeah. somewhere. Um, you, huge advocate for enlisted PME. Um, so much so that you, you know, PME hard, you even named, um, you know, one of your further ventures after you retired, uh, you know, after that, that very thing, how important to you, especially on the enlisted side is not, is having additional stuff into PME. And more importantly, what would you add to PME as the enlisted, you know, folks go through to get to that kind of Jedi master to be a mentor? Yeah. So development is all about training, education, and experiences, and self-study, okay? <clears throat> and, and then uh, circled around all of that is that mentor, that leader that is guiding them and everything, you know? Certainly in training, training, everything we do in training has to be focused on what the mission is and what our mission essential tasks are and ultimately what we're expected to do in combat. Education is all about building someone to get to the next level. Yeah, we select people for promotion on potential and everything. But I think what we've got to get more into our professional military education is scenario-based stuff that is based on combat, okay? Um, here recently, you know, because of all the things that have gone on, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, January 6th, the fallout of Afghanistan, we focus more because we had a political agenda that came down 
from Washington, D.C. that said that you're not as cohesive as you think you are. We know what's best for you. So you're going to get after this diversity, equity, inclusion, because you've got major problems with it, racism and extremism down there. And as I traversed the force back then, it again, like I mentioned earlier, people didn't know what to talk to each other because they were a cohesive team, you know, and <clears throat> all of a sudden we were telling them, well, you have to acknowledge first someone by their race, their gender, or their sexual orientation. And then, you know, you can identify them by who, whatever they do in, in the Army or the Air Force or whatever. And that's completely counter. We transcend all of that stuff. We accept everybody, regardless of their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, or whatever. And as long as they are an effective member of the team, then we accept them in. And we love them just like we love our children and everything. But the, the you know, at the strategic level, we're saying, well, you know, you got it backwards and everything. And that caused us problems, okay? Uh, and then it caused us to take our focus off of, because, you know, when we came out of Afghanistan, hey, we might be entering this era of persistent peace, you know? And then, what, six months news later, flash. Russia <laughs> won invasion in yeah, Ukraine. Bad, bad news. And then you have the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, on the 4th of October saying the Middle East is the quietest it's been in years because of this administration. Three days later. Three days yeah. later, all of a sudden there's electric hand gliders going out of Gaza into Israel. You know, Israeli women are being raped. Israelis are, heads are being chopped off and everything. And next thing you know, we have a full on war in Israel again, you know, and everything. And so we have to understand and, and the military and especially any political administration can't take away that the United States of America is the number one partner for global peace and security around the world, period. Now, China wants to replace us, but we have to understand that, that China is a threat to us. And there are other threats to us. And the bottom line, the world is a fucked up place. <laughs> We're fucked up mm -hmm. people. What you won't hear in South Africa right now is that, you know, the leading candidate to be the next prime minister in that nation said that we need to have a white genocide in that nation. And sooner or later, we're going to have it, okay? But people are going to elect that guy. But you won't hear from our media saying, hey, you know, we got to keep an eye on this guy because he's talking genocide. But, you know, you'll have people in Times Square that, you know, they are one 132nd Palestinian, and all of a sudden they're protesting for Hamas and everything, right. you know? My point in all of this is, our PME has to be focused on how do we build the best soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, guardian, whether it's active guard or reserve, and how do we build the best version of that that can be best effective under the worst conditions they could encounter in combat, whether they're a frontline combat service member or a combat support service member or combat service support service member or wherever they're fighting on ground, air, sea, subterranean, wherever, how do we build that best version within our PME? And so I think more scenarios within our professional military education that get after that. The, the, the guy that has to pull the trigger in, you know, NORAD headquarters to shoot down an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, we do exercises all the time to prepare everybody for stuff like that. Do we prepare him physically, mentally, and emotionally, though, that he is going to make a decision or she's going to make a decision that will either save hundreds of thousands of people from a potential nuclear weapon coming from China or North Korea? Do they understand the ramifications that if they don't get it right, it could be a bad day for our nation? Do we teach? No, we just we teach them, hey, this is what you're expected to do, but we don't do it with the necessary sensitivity that comes with what could happen on the worst day of your life. And I think we need more of that in our PME to get after building this force that can not only fight and win, but because we have the ability to fight and win, our potential adversaries know that. And then we're getting after this deterrence that our national, strat national defense strategy is talking about right now. Right. And that also comes with our strategic level leaders with language 
that gets after supporting that. Telling somebody like Iran, and you guys know the Iranians very well from, you know, fighting proxies, you know, the Shia militias and all the, the other assholes out there, the Houthis, the Hezbollah, all of them, you know, that telling somebody like Iran, be careful. They're not toddlers, right. dude. Okay, that's not going to do anything. Uh, uh, don't. That was that was okay. the quote that I was going to no. bring up. Like, here's you know, don't is not deterrence. Everybody, you know, you know what is no, it's a, a lethal, well trained, well equipped force that is not distracted by whatever cultural milieu we're going through. That's mm -hmm. an actual force that has deterrence yeah. because deterrence comes with consequence, not with more words, not with you know, very famously, ex yeah, strongly, strongly written letters. Listen, yeah. we're. Here's what we're going to have. There's a bunch of people. Four billions yeah, of there's dollars. a bunch of people and they sign this letter and boy, do they mean it. You know, I'm, remi I'm reminded of uh, Ross Perot <laughs> back in the day. Ross Perot was famous for his quips, but he used to say, you know, I'm not, I don't want to have a committee about killing snakes. I want to go kill snakes. And that's what deterrence is, yeah. is we don't have a, we don't, Absolutely. you know, you say whatever you want for DJT, you know, number 45. But when you can sit at a dinner with somebody and go, oh, hey, I just killed Soleimani with a with a hellfire that basically has katanas that fall out of it and before this chocolate cake gets served if you do this with me i will kill you at your table that's what just that's what deterrence looks like right and you know on the world yeah. stage right now we have a lack of credible credible deterrence capital i think is what we should call it so well think of this when i was the c act you know and you brought up trump when i was the c act you know um mattis brought video to show trump of these barrel bombs in syria that out of Russian helicopters that the Syrian forces were using, the Assad regime was using these barrel bombs that had chlorine weapons in them and dropping them on his innocent Syrians. And there was videos of these Syrian children suffocating to death from these weapons. Trump said, do something. And we dropped 59 Tomahawk missiles on Russian and Syrian infrastructure associated with those barrel bombs and those helicopters uh, on the western side of the the middle Euphrates River Valley. Guess what? No more barrel bombs. After Weird. That. Okay. Correlation doesn't See, equal causation, you know, CX, but I, I understand I, what you're saying. Nothing says time out more <laughs> than 59 Tomahawk right. missiles, okay? And What's, uh, what's the joke you about, know, a, you know, it, these Syrians are about to find out why America doesn't have free health care? Because we're about to lob 59 yeah. cruise missiles at them for <laughs> effing around? Yeah, yeah I, I'm with you, you know? And uh, that's why I love, you know, Regardless of, you know, a Netanyahu is prosecuting this war in Gaza the way we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know. He's done tactical call-outs. He has done evacuations. Obviously, the enemy gets a vote. They ain't letting people leave and everything. And then in the end, we do all of the prudent risk necessary before we go after targets. That's what the Israelis are doing. Unfortunately, collateral damage is happening. It is happening on a grand scale because of the things that Hamas is doing, the, you know, the Palestinian citizens refusing to leave and everything. But the bottom line, you know, when Netanyahu says, Hamas, you got two options, surrender or die, all right? Because that's the only way this is going to end. You either surrender or we're going to kill you, you know? And you, when you talk about language, think of a message to the force that that Netanyahu's message had. And it, it likens me back to when Mattis was the Secretary of Defense and he was being interviewed by Hannity on the Hannity show and was asked, what keeps you awake at night? And he said, nothing. I keep others awake at night. Think of the message that sent to mm -hmm. the force, to the troops. Man, we we ain't going to put up with any shit yeah. out here, you know. And uh, that's the kind of messaging we need. And that's not grandstanding. If we have the capability to back it up, which we do then it's not grandstand. We're just telling you what reality is. And America you know? is a more peaceful place. Uh, you know, when, when America leads, the world follows. And typically you find your, your moments of peace, um, you know, over the last 20 years is when America has been strong. And, you know, we've made our mistakes as well. Yeah. Hey, got it. But the pendulum is swinging back towards, you know, the pendulum swung pretty hard. You know, 2018, 2019, the pendulum took a pretty hard swing. And, you know, we're now coming out of this weird five year period that we're calling, you know, from 2018 really to 2023, early in 2024. That pendulum is swinging back hard. And you've taken on a lot, a, a whole lot um, of responsibility. Even after your 37 year career, you're like, no, nope, this isn't good enough. We're going to start PM, uh, PMEHard.com. 
and you even do your own podcast and your own video series and you have leader talk where you sit down and you talk about some of these concepts. Is that just a natural thing for you? I, I imagine much like, you know, the three of us on here, you're probably a, a military working dog. Like if I leave you alone for long enough, you'll probably chew on some furniture. I have a, <laughs> I have a feeling uh, just from knowing you during this talk, but what, what yeah. led you into, you know, <laughs> continuing to serve by helping other people with Chachi and with some of your other friends? Um, you know, you, we kind of teased about CZ and, and what he's got plans on doing for after his career. We'll let him tell that story on his own. But was it just a natural move for you or did you still have a need to, to really engage and, and help people win? I just think it's, you know, when you give a shit, you know, and you care and and you want to continue to focus on the three imperatives that I have right now, which is paying it forward to the current force, however I can. You know, and I just posted my statistics from 2023. I did 87 speaking engagements in 2023. 200 in days on the road. You ain't slowing down, baby. You got that. 211 Let's days go. on the road. 34 podcasts. Hey, it's only the 2nd of January and you're the first podcast. The Air Force year. is official on official um, podcast. Let's go. <laughs> we go big. <laughs> but uh, um, so paying it forward to the current force, giving back to my fellow veterans and making sure that they're not forgotten about. And and then uh, in the end, you know, uh, enjoying the ride, you know, and spending time with my family, making it comfortable and everything. But I think... <clears throat> I truly give a shit about my nation. I truly give a shit about every American in this nation and abroad. I give a shit about our partners and allies. People, you know, all the time, when I left as the SEAC at my retirement ceremony, there were 34 international SEACs there to include the Ukrainian SEAC. And the minute the war kicked off, the full-on war kicked off, the first guy that Alexander Kaczynski called was me. And he, because we were friends, we weren't just, well, I, I, I'm retired now. You got to be friends with CZ and not mm -hmm. me, you know? I mean, these were transformational relationships, not transactional. And so, you know, now 2024, I've got a full plate of overseas travel already. And I may find myself in Kiev, Ukraine. Now, I'm not going to say when I'm going to go because I don't need some Spetsnats, you know, coming in like <laughs> in a black Chinook trying to, you know, carry me away like some. I was going to say, are you, you're going to find yourself yeah, right. there talking or yeah. find yourself there with a rifle? Oh, no, that ship has sailed, brother. <laughs> the best thing I can do is hand out coffee and donuts, you nice. know. But, uh, <laughs> but the bottom line is, Aaron, is I give a shit and I care. And I'm not going to stop caring about my nation. And when I think something's wrong, I'm going to say I think it's wrong, you know. And then so my show, my YouTube show, Leader Talk, is my platform to give my opinion, you know, and just like, you know, you guys use this show to continue to promote communication and everything. And that's what I do that for. That's why I continue to keep supporting the troops when they invite me out. And I'm, this will be my fifth year of retirement and Chachi and I got a big schedule this year. And, and uh, I've got a big schedule with other organizations that I support and I'm going to keep doing it. One, because I'm healthy. One, I'm having fun. And three, I give a shit. And lastly, because my wife supports me in doing all of this stuff. And we got to get away from when you retire that you're supposed to go away. You know, and if some people want to leave the military and they want to go fishing and stuff. God bless you. Go do it. But that's not the, the, the stereotype, okay? The stereotype should be I'm going to continue to support. And I'm also going to continue to give my own opinion, you know, because when you retire, you lose all your authority. I can't even get in the Pentagon now without somebody escorting me in. That's you got to get one of them tours. But I do have an opinion, and it's an informed opinion from 37 years of service and four years at the strategic most level. And I'm not going to allow that to go by. And if I think something's wrong, I'm going to keep saying it. So I think it all boils down to how much does the individual give a shit and how much will they use their platform and everything they do to continue to show that they give a shit. And I will tell you, I'm teamed up with a very influential CEO and probably the most influential African-American woman in the business community since Oprah. Her name is Fawn Weaver. She's the CEO of Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey. She's the CEO of Grant Sydney. She's on the board 
of Endeavor, which just merged WWE and UFC and everything. And, uh, and she's now on the Medal of Honor Society board. And her and I are teaming up to get after this recruiting crisis. You know, and what can we do with our platforms, a former SEAC and one of the most influential people in business? What can we do together to bring attention to the goodness of military service and then showcase to people in the military why it's good to stay in? And over the course of this last summer, her and I visited 34 bases in 100 days, 106 days to show our appreciation, Ooh. but more importantly, to showcase the goodness of military service. And everywhere we went, gents, we visited battlefield airmen and ASOSs, STSs, and things like that. So, you know, your population was well, well represented on who we were talking about. Good. Well, and you know what? SEAC, that brings us to the end because it sounds like throughout your 37 years and knowing what you're going to do in the future, let's start off. You know, usually we ask for advice. I'm going to hold that to the end. Tell us where we can find you, what projects <laughs> you're excited about so that we can link it and everything that we do and make sure we're sharing your stuff. So uh, I'm on all social media platforms, uh, Facebook. I have a Facebook page, eTool Nation. It is a page that's made up of about 3,000 followers right now that is all about people that live the warrior ethos that have a reasonable common sense approach to things going on in our nation. It's not a political page. It's not there to promote any right wing or left wing kind of stuff. It's just people that give a shit about their nation that... Uh, you know, and, and apply reasonable common sense to key issues going on in our nation. Um, you can find me on Instagram, JW Trox. Uh, I'm also on X, uh, PME Hard Trox. I'm also on LinkedIn, John Troxel. I also have a YouTube channel, SEAC Retired John Wayne Troxel. Just posted my fifth episode there talking about national security and everything. And uh, so, and then I have my webpage, PMEHard.com. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where you can find everything about me to include my memoir. Nice. I wrote my memoir, Surrender or Die, Reflections of a Combat Leader. And you can also find every issue of our leadership magazine, Leader Talk Today, on there. You can download these magazines for free. The books ain't for free because, you know, my wife expects me to still make <laughs> yeah, her some money. There you right? go. That's yeah. good. Yeah, we have to ask the business. The, uh, the CFO <laughs> probably does not like um, and so the other part of that is, you know, I support nine different businesses. I'm a consultant. Uh, key ones, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's nonprofit, Hiring Our Heroes. I'm an ambassador for them. I'm an ambassador, national ambassador for the Veterans of Foreign War. And I also support other key organization, organizations that help the force like Beaver Fit, uh, you know, ESSI wear and uh, other folks like that. Downrange supplements. I'm wearing their shirt today that are looking to give uh, better uh, for you choices in terms of supplementation in our commissaries and PXs and things like that. All the things I'm doing, gentlemen, is to help the warfighter, their families, and our veterans. And that, that's kind of what I do. We'll get the book on the reading list and everybody will be able to have all the links out there. SEAC Troxel, I appreciate it. The last thing we're gonna end on, we ask everybody, we didn't tell you on purpose because we wanted to surprise you and get you to say something to get you canceled because that's what we do here on this show. But obviously, you know, our, our niche, the people listening to us right now are trying to figure out, you know, do I want to go into the military? Do I want to be, you know, a, some sort of special operator? What level of sacrifice, you know, do I want to have here? And sometimes they're on the fence and they always come to us with advice. And we figured out between the three of us, we're just not that smart. We, we don't have as many experiences as the people we bring on. What advice would you give to somebody in that space thinking about trying something impossible with everything you've achieved? Um. It's the same advice I give everybody. Okay, first of all, dream big. All right, what do you want to do with your life? And, you know, the military is a great place to come in and dream big. You know, here I was a kid, no purpose, motivation, and direction, no, no life skills or anything, joined the military. And everything that I wanted to do in the military, I was able to do. Okay, now, you know, because the world's a fucked up place, obviously, there's some people out there who are going to give you the opportunity to go to combat and and, uh, you know, and, and defend our country and everything. But I wanted to be an airborne ranger. I just had to raise my hand and go and do it. I wanted to be a jump master. I wanted to be a pathfinder. I wanted to be a college graduate. I wanted to get a master's degree. All the things I did, I just dreamt big and then went out and got after it, you know. <laughs> but you, get, you can dream big, but you got to set lofty but attainable goals, okay? And 
if it's a goal that you know that you can never attain, then don't make it a goal, okay? Make it something that you know through hard work, perseverance, and sacrifice that you can get after and you can do it, okay? And then you got to visualize every day, what are you going to do to get better? You got to visualize, what are you going to do to meet those goals and everything? And then in the end, actualize, go through the actions necessary to reach your goals, to get after your dreams, and do it with prudent risk as you're getting after it. And don't be afraid along the journey to evaluate and reassess if you have, may have to go a different direction, okay? And then in the end, enjoy the ride and everything you do. I will tell you, you all know this. We do a lot of tough shit in the military. And, but it, it's, it's a very rewarding job. Probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life is serve in uniform. Even to where I'm at now, where I've made life so comfortable for my family now, post-military, that still doesn't have the rewards that I got that built me into what John Wayne Troxell became. And through it all, though, I still enjoyed the ride. I still did the things that young people did, you know, and I talked earlier, you know, about, you know, going to bed at eight o'clock at night on New Year's Eve and waking up New Year's Day without a hangover. But those days years ago were far worse than that because I love to enjoy imbibing in cold beverages or, or, you know, doing keg stands and all this other stuff we did growing <laughs> up, you know, the kind of the silly stuff and everything. But I did it, you know, with uh, in moderation and I did it in a responsible kind of way because I understood that I was part of something bigger than myself, known as the, as the United States military. And in the end, joining the military means that you are going to be a part of something bigger than yourself and that you will self-actualize in the military by being part of that something bigger than yourself and buying into that concept that comes with swearing an oath to something bigger than yourself. That's my advice. Um, some people can live in a canned world with minimal risk and go through life. But at the end of that life, will they be able to say, did I reach my untapped potential? Did I give it all? Okay. Did I maximize my opportunity? I mean, I was 18 years old. I had never left the state of Iowa. And here, when I retired from the military, I had been to 96 of the 169 countries in the world, you know, some of them not by choice, like most <laughs> of us, you know, but the bottom line is, <laughs> I'm a much different person and a more worldly person than I was when I was 18 years old because of my military service. And you can't replicate that 99.9% .9 of the time by doing something that's not associated with service in a military or something like that. Well said. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Follow absolutely up, not. Yeah. I'm just going to close it up. See, <laughs> John Wayne Traxel, no, Traxel number three. <laughs> The man, the myth, the legend. We want to say thank you for coming on, not only for coming on the podcast and talking to these young folks and continuing to get after everything you're doing with leadership, but thank you for your 37 years of service. Our circles obviously overlap in many different uh, many different places, but we just want to say thank you for you know having the humility to come on and, and the, the time to spend with us because we take a ton from it. So from us to you, uh, you know Trent as well, man, sure. thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time and for everything that you're given. Thanks a lot, gents. I really appreciate it. And I always end everything like this with a big boom. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Everybody else, we'll see you next time. Train hard.